Sam Asarvadam, one of the cardiac electrophysiologists. So that's a cardiologist who specializes in heart rhythm disturbances. Most of my work is treating patients who have either a very fast heart rate or a very slow heart rate. And a common cause of a fast heart rate that I do a procedure called an ablation procedure for is atrial fibrillation. So patients and physicians have many choices when they're thinking about how to treat atrial fibrillation. And probably in our practice, it's the disease that's most important to customize the treatment to the patient. There are two broad ways to try and treat atrial fibrillation. One is called rate control, and the second is called rhythm control. Rate control means we're letting the patient continue to be in atrial fibrillation, but we make sure the lower chamber doesn't beat too fast. And this is done usually with using medicines that help the AV node. You remember the natural security guard of the heart? These drugs help the AV node, slow the rate down, and in many patients, maybe half of our patients, that's all that's needed to keep them free of their symptoms. For the other half, either the drugs aren't effective in keeping their heart rate down or the drug produces too many side effects, we then think about rhythm control. Rhythm control means making the atrial fibrillation go away and keeping the rhythm normal, preventing it from coming back. There is no difference in terms of how long patients will live or how they do in the long term whether you do rhythm control or rate control. It's a question of which will work best for a given patient. Typically, we would do rate control first, and if this doesn't work, we think of rhythm control. Now, once it's decided that we would use rhythm control, there are now two main ways to try and do that, make the atrial fibrillation go away. One is using medicines or drugs called antiarrhythmic drugs. And the second is some kind of procedure that's done in the body, in the hospital. And the most common of those procedures is called ablation. Now with some pictures, we'll explain what ablation is shortly. But first, something about antiarrhythmic drugs. There are several that are used today for trying to maintain normal rhythm. They work about 50 to 60% of the time. That means if you gave these drugs to 100 people with atrial fibrillation, at the end of a year, 50 of them will say they're feeling fine. Now that doesn't mean their atrial fibrillation is gone, but it's controlled enough that they don't need anything more done. But when these drugs fail, and the patient continues to be symptomatic with lifestyle altering symptoms, then we think about an invasive procedure. These invasive procedures are done like an angiogram or other procedures done by cardiologists where the chest is not opened. So it's not open chest surgery, but the procedure is done through the veins, either the veins near the legs or the vein in the side of the neck that allows us to place wires or catheters into the heart, find the place that's abnormal, and try to burn. And burning has a fancier name when we use it in arrhythmias, and that's called ablation. How we do the burning is with radio waves. We can also freeze the abnormal tissue, and in rare circumstances, use some other energy source to do the burning. The ablation procedure is not for everyone. First, simple things should be tried, like controlling the heart rate or a simpler type of heart rhythm medicine. But in a lot of people, this doesn't work and, and someone continues to have symptoms. Then we think seriously and have 
a lengthy conversation with our patients about the advantages and disadvantages of having an ablation procedure. Now, ablation doesn't work in everyone. It works in about 70% of people. In the other 30%, there probably just is too many areas that are abnormal and can make atrial fibrillation. In those patients, sometimes using an approach that includes a pacemaker can be effective in controlling their symptoms. But in these 70% of patients where ablation helps, you don't have something like a pacemaker that will always be there in your body and you are free of the symptoms that were affecting your lifestyle. So that's the main goal. Now ablation itself has some downsides. It's an invasive procedure and like anything that's done in the body, there are some complications that can happen. Some are fairly frequent, maybe two to five percent of the time a person can have bleeding like around the veins where the catheters were placed. These are not life-threatening or generally serious and simply putting some pressure on that site it may get better. But there are some very serious complications that can happen with ablation. A patient can develop a stroke just because of ablation. The heating of the tissue can affect the heating of blood. The blood can clot and a stroke can occur. Fortunately, this is very rare, happening less than 1 in 500 of patients who undergo a procedure. And again, fortunately, most of those tend to be fairly small and patients get back to normal. There are life-threatening complications that can happen with an ablation as well. The best known of these is if too much heating is done on the back wall of the heart, near the lung veins, sometimes that heating can produce a hole or a fistula that connects the food pipe, the esophagus, with the heart. If this is not recognized quickly and treated, this can be fatal. The incidence or the chance of this happening is again fortunately small and the risk we tell our patients is about a one in a thousand chance of a complication like that happening. I will mention later about some of the specific things including some things we do when doing the ablation at Mayo Clinic that we believe decreases the chance of some of these complications but there is no way to do this procedure without risk. What I tell patients when they're thinking about whether they should have this procedure or not is to ask themselves how much is their life affected by these symptoms and think if you were one of the patients who had a complication. Would you go back and think, well, I was fine to begin with, I didn't really need to do anything, then ablation is not for you. On the other hand, if you think, I cannot deal with this any longer. It's affecting my life. I understand there are risks, but I also know the risks are small and the chance that I be benefit and improve my lifestyle is high. Those are the patients we consider strongly for the ablation procedure.